Hello, my name is Amin Benjakun. I'm here to talk about gauge equivariant mesh CNNs and isotropic convolutions on geometric graphs. This is work by Dahan, Wheeler, Cohen, and Welling, and this was submitted and accepted to ICLR 2021. So, when we talk about convolutions, we're usually talking about identifying patterns in a neighborhood. In the case of a convolution on a mesh, uh, the way these usually work is by identifying the vertex whose neighborhood you're interested in, in this case, the blue vertex, flattening that neighborhood into this 2D graph structure as you see on the right. And then for each of these orange neighbors, you're going to take the features at those neighbors, weigh them by a convolutional weight K and give them to the blue vertex. And in this way, the blue vertex learns a little something something about its neighborhood. Now these convolutional kernels K do not depend on the direction at which these incident edges are coming into the blue vertex. And this is a problem because this leads to an isotropic kernel that is not very expressive. Here's why they're not very expressive. If you applied the graph convolution I described before to these separate neighborhoods, they would spit out the exact same answer. We would like it to spit out different answers because we would like to be able to distinguish between these two different neighborhoods. The only difference here is the, um, the, it, the only difference here is the green dot that is slightly rotated around. So the solution to this is to make kernels anisotropic and that's exactly what this work aims to do. And they do so by embedding anisotropy into the convolutional kernel um, by building a local reference frame and making the kernel depend on that reference frame as well as imposing some constraints on that kernel. And they show that by, by doing this anisotropy, by adding this anisotropy, you can efficiently achieve state-of-the-art performance on shape correspondence data sets, as well as a, a synthetic MNIST data set, while requiring less pre-processing than other techniques. Okay, so the first step of this algorithm is the easiest. Um, you basically set up a gauge, and all that means is you pick a reference edge. In this case, the orange edge is the reference edge. And once you set up your gauge, you notice that every other edge can be described by the angle theta that it makes with the reference edge. And all you have to do now is make your convolutional kernel depend on theta. And by definition, you have an anisotropic kernel there. One more tidbit before we move on is that this angle theta is calculated on the tangent plane of your vertex. And this, can, this tangent plane is calculated as a pre-processing step and is easy to do before you start training, OK? So one problem you might have is, all right, we picked the reference edge, the orange edge, arbitrarily. What if we picked the reference edge instead to be the blue edge? We noticed that that would make all the angles theta different. And that would also make, as a result, the output to our convolution different. So now our convolutional output depends on which reference edge we pick. And the reference edge can be arbitrary. This is not great. Thankfully, this is not something that is unfamiliar to us as deep learning researchers. Uh, we, can, we can impose an equivariance constraint. So equivariance just means a function f is equivariant to g if, if you apply g to the input, you get the exact same answer as if you only apply g to the output. In this case, f is the convolution operation and g is a change of gauge. So what does this look like in 2D? If you have an input mesh angle, okay, theta, and you have an output feature associated with that uh, input mesh angle. Let's say now you change your gauge, AKA you rotate the green line and have a different starting gauge, then your theta becomes bigger. And that should hopefully, if it's equivariant, that should, only, that should rotate your output feature like so. This was in the 2D case. Now let's take this in the arbitrary MD input and ND output case. Uh, and this is the equation we need to satisfy now. This is just the general gauge equivariance equation that needs to be satisfied. How do we satisfy this? We, the only way we can satisfy this is by breaking this down and looking at the structure of these row in and row out matrices. And so it might not surprise you to see that row in and row out are actual, actually planar rotation matrices of SO2. In 2D, it was easy to visualize, maybe a little harder in arbitrary dimensions, but all they do is they they take an input angle and they output a rotation matrix that looks like this. And this rotation matrix, if you spend your time looking at uh, planar rotations of SO2, planar representations of SO2, you'll see that all of them have a very similar structure, a very similar block diagonal structure, okay? 
Uh, usually you have a one somewhere and you have these two by two matrices somewhere. And this is not a coincidence. This is because representations of SO2 can be built from irreducible representations of SO2 by blockwise concatenation. Um, so in this case, the irreducible representations of SO2 is a limited set given by row zero equals one. There's our one. And then a whole bunch of other two by two rotation matrices that might seem familiar to you, parameterized by n. So all you need to do now to build, a, let's say, a four by four representation of SO2 is to pick which irreducible representations you want. You can pick two row ones, as you can pick two row zeros as well as one row one, or you can pick two row ones. The world is yours. The choice is yours. And so um, now we have, now we come back to our equation to leverage this knowledge. We review that rho in is m by m and rho out is n by n. And we're solving for an n by m matrix k. And so remember, let's assign some hard, well, let's, just, let's assign some concrete dimensionality to our inputs and outputs. A row in is five by five, row out is four by four. Low row out looks like this maybe uh, because you picked the irreducible representations to be one and three. Again, you can pick these irreducible representations to be anything you want. This can be a hyperparameter to your network. Similarly, for row n, you can pick row n to be composed of row zero, row one, row one. And this is what it's going to look like. And now, well, how do we need to reason about what k looks like? Well, k, you can split it up into six different submatrices. And you do this just right so that each of these submatrices act on a very specific part of row n and row out. So for example, k10 only acts on the row zero part of row n and the row one part of row out. Similarly, k31 only acts on the input part of row one and the output part of row three. This leads to a system of six equations, six equations because all of these sub blocks need to abide by the gauge equivariance constraint from before. We're just gonna look at one to get a feeling for how to solve these. K31, how do we solve the K31 equation? Well, they actually solve this analytically and there's only a small set of possible solutions. So this is nice because we've made these smaller problems, there's only a smaller set of solutions. Okay, so it turns out that they provide us with a table of how to find the solution and it turns out for arbitrary N and M input and output, the solution has these matrices as linearly independent solutions for this. So in general, K31 is a linear combination of these matrices. So a scalar times this matrix plus a scalar times this matrix plus a scalar times that matrix and a scalar plus this matrix. This leads to your general solution of K31. And these scalars W1, W2, W3, W4, turns out these are actually going to be learned weights by your network. You're not going to put these in yourself. You're going to let the network learn what the optimal W1, W2, W3, W4 are. Finally, your feed forward loop looks like this. Now, instead of only summing over each neighbor, for each neighbor, you're also going to look at each of these submatrix blocks and each of these um, bases, each of these linearly independent solutions and their weights, okay? And so this is the simple feed forward convolution operation this paper proposes. Now, when I've been talking, I've been conveniently glossing over this row in over here, okay? And this is a, the reason I've been doing that is there's a very simple explanation for it that I want to talk about a little bit at the end. The reason you need this extra rotation matrix is you need to remember that when you set up a gauge, you're basically setting up a local reference frame at each vertex. And each feature lives in that local reference frame at each vertex, okay? And so if, you, if you're adding two different features that live on two different vertices, you need to account for the fact that they live in different reference frames. Here's a flat plane example. For example, you have two different frames defined by two different gauges here. If you wanted to add a feature on each of these frames, you just need to rotate their gauges so that they are well aligned. And so that's a simple 2D rotation matrix. In 3D though, with curvature, this things get a little trickier is that you don't only need to make sure that the gauges align well, you also need to make sure that the tangent plane themselves align well. And so you can work out how to align your tangent plane just right so by cranking out some linear algebra. They provide some equations in the paper, and then you can project that back to 2D to get another 2D rotation matrix and everything works out. So you just need to account for this aligning phenomenon before you sum up 
features from different vertices. Okay, and this, is, and this problem in discrete differential geometry is called parallel transport. Um, and finally, to test out their solution, they take the MNIST data set that we know and love, composed of a bunch of different images. Um, they convert the images into 3D meshes, okay? Or 2D meshes embedded in 3D. And to these meshes, they're then going to apply different amounts of noise, okay? Different, so now you have multiple data sets, each dealing with MNIST with, that has different sets of noise. And you're going to train the anisotropic mesh CNNs on different versions of these data sets to compare it to the isotropic graph CNN. So the baseline here is given in blue, and that's the isotropic graph CNN performance. And as you can see, it doesn't change because it wouldn't change because the isotropic graph CNN only deals with, uh, only has weights for, that only has weights that change with connectivity. Whereas the anisotropic graph CNN does change uh, because it does depend on, you know, the general um, orientation and direction that each of these edges are coming in. So we see that there's still a large range. We see that there's a large range of roughnesses for which anisotropic graph CNNs consistently outperform isotropic graph CNNs. And this is sort of like a stress testing experiment to see where exactly these anisotropic graph CNNs break down and how exact, where exactly they're better and by how much they're better. Finally, they also test their results on the Faust shape correspondence data set. This data set is a bunch of human meshes and you need to classify each vertex in each mesh with a label. Is this vertex a knee vertex? Is this vertex a face vertex, etc. And needless to say, this anisotropic graph CNN, um, this anisotropic mesh CNN, sorry, um, achieve state-of-the-art performance while needing less pre-processing. Other methods might require you to calculate features using geodesic PDEs type of uh, transformations, not this method. Additionally, other methods might require specific assumptions about the data set, such that it is well meshed across different meshes or that different meshes have the same connectivity. Again, this is not a constraint or a problem for this uh, neural network at all for this type of operation at all. Um, and so ultimately we show that we can simply and elegantly achieve better performance than other data sets on the Faust shape correspondence task. And they also show that um, it is more expressive than the regular isotropic graph CNNs on the MNIST, on an embedded MNIST data set. Great.